Uh, Horatio Clare's books include Running for the Hills, uh, Somerset Morn Award, A Single Swallow, Down to the Sea in Ships, uh, the Stanford Dolman Travel Book of the Year, Aubrey and the Terrible Ute, uh, which was the best debut children's book for the Brantford Bowies Award, Icebreaker, A Voyage Far North, The Light in the Dark, A Winter Journal, and something of his art, Walking to Lubick with J.S. Bark. Horatio broadcasts regularly on BBC Radio, writes for various papers and magazines, and lectures in non-fiction at the University of Manchester. So over to you, Horatio. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, uh, written by me, awfully. Um, and thank you all for uh, coming and for inviting me uh, to this. Um, it's very interesting listening to your various biographies, um, the interest not just in sound but in silence, uh, which is, I think, a vastly, uh, probably unexplored territory. Uh, Richard, I'd be fascinated in your PhD. Um, when we started doing sound walks, I mean, the, the idea was slow radio to start with. Uh, silence, I think, was still something of an anathema. Uh, you didn't really hear it on radio. The great broadcasters know how to use it, of course. Uh, I think we, we've all heard Alistair Cook and the way he would say, good evening, friends, uh, and have you from that moment. But it's very rare that we let people speak for very long, certainly um, on Radio 4. Uh, Radio 3 famously is slightly addicted to silence. Um, the most understanding station, probably, of that force um, in fact, when I worked for Radio 3, you'd make a program. I used to make The Verb with Ian McMillan, a poetry program, and you'd record it, and then you'd put it on to a CD for transmission, and Radio 3 Con would insist that you also sent them silence. And if you didn't send them silence on the end of your program, they would send it back. And I used to think, haven't they got enough silence that they must ask for more? Um, but it was so that if the thing ran out, they would know stuff was happening. Um, and so the first sound, the first slow radio walk um, was Alan Davies' idea, I believe, um, him and Jessica Isaacs. And they were partly inspired by the slow movement, which begins, I think, in, probably in Italy with slow food and a whole different way of conceiving how existence might meaningfully be lived, uh, a, a, a rejection of the speed culture, which probably begins with the futurists uh, in the early 20th century and has only got faster, um, much, I think, to everybody's detriment. And we've all noticed during lockdown, I think, how time has changed when you remove the artificial constraints uh, that we all uh, subscribe to of the working week um, and the need to get out uh, and getting and spending and lay waste our powers, I think, as Wordsworth put it. Um, and so from the slow food movement, where nothing is rushed uh, and everything is cooked slowly and eaten slowly, Italian rural culture insists that a, a meal takes several hours and is punctuated by conversation and easy silence, um, although not much of that in Italy. It then becomes, there's a sort of slow art movement. So you get slow TV uh, in Norway um, and a wood fire burning and a coal barge traveling. Uh, and then a train, uh, just a camera, become hugely successful. Uh, and the Norwegians, and it seems to me the Scandinavians, or perhaps it's something to do with that northernness, that space and acclimatization to silence. Um, indeed, in Finland, of course, silence is a mode of speech. Uh, adjust to this, take to it um, hugely. And as things have more increasingly done, it filters down to us. Uh, so you remember the sort of hugger movement, um, although you know, that which was being cosy in winter, essentially, which our newspapers are very excited about, and all these things can be marketed, of course. Uh, and I found the equivalent in Finland, which was Kalsakranit, which is to get drunk at home in your underwear, alone, with no intention of going out. Um, and that becomes, although that's slightly irrelevant, but the slow movement gets to Alan Davy and Jessica Isaacs, and they think, we'll try slow radio. And it was bank holiday, which is always a question for the networks, because, of course, you want to let as many of your producers and, and assistants and engineers out as possible, so you want to pre-record. But what? Um, and their idea was a slow walk to Hay, a sound walk to Hay, along the Welsh border. 
uh, and legend goes they wanted Robert McFarlane to do it, who is a friend and hero of mine, as you would. Uh, astonishingly knowledgeable, brilliant, wonderful writer and man. Uh, and they called Peter Florence. I don't know if this is true, but Peter said, who runs the Hay Festival, and the, the destination of the walk was Hay Festival, do you have McFarlane's number? Can you ask him about this? And Peter says, he says, sure, yeah, I'll just give him a call. Hung up the phone, didn't do anything about it, rang them back and said, uh, he says, no, have you thought of a ratio? Uh, and so I got a job. And I grew up there, which was uh, added usefulness. But I don't know that side of the mountains, um, the, the ridge along Offa's Dyke, at all, because it's an intensely local experience growing up in Wales. Uh, perhaps it is everywhere, but we know our valleys very well. And those valleys over there are a complete mystery. Um, and so I crammed like hell and read up on people like Chatwin um, and uh, the poets of the border and Raymond Williams and um, got ready to do it. And neither I nor the producer really knew what to expect. Um, the recordist on whom everything hangs as those of you who podcast and, and, and produce know, um, this guy was called Richard Andrews, and he wouldn't mind me saying it now, but he was part of public service broadcasting, an extraordinarily successful rock band, and he had a choice between going off with them or being a BBC studio manager, and he chose to be a studio manager. Um, and so he went to see Piers Plowright uh, and other engineers and producers of the oldest school and said, how do I do this? And they came back with a device that was effectively, it's, it's a rucksack with a pole sticking out of it, a microphone stand. And the rucksack contains all the batteries and the recording equipment. On top of the microphone stand, there's a cover. And on top of that, there's a rye coat. But inside the cover and the rye coat, the furry thing that defrays wind noise, there are at least five microphones recording. So that's five tracks. And then really holding a handheld mic, also covered in a rye coat, recording his footsteps over the ground and the brush of things on the sides of his boots. So that's the feet of the kind of composite presenter that you're making. So that's six tracks. And then there's a radio mic on me, uh, which is also recording separately as a backup and talking to his backpack. So that's seven tracks. Uh, and then there's an output with a pair of headphones to the producer who walks along looking nervous next to Richard. And in order for everything not to cross uh, and mess up, uh, I walk about on the whole 10, 20 yards ahead of them, which really works actually, because you get a, a feeling of solitude, but also a feeling that you're talking to your friends behind you. And of course, when I started, I didn't know them and I was nervous anyway. Uh, and the idea of slow was quite daunting um, because we wanted lots of space and time. And, and it was varying between, is this documentary, is it art? Because if it's art, then you can have, you know, 10 minutes of footsteps crossing different kinds of ground, and you will lose a slice of the audience, of course you will, but a certain slice will be delighted and interested by it. Um, and so what the producer, Philip Tagney, did was slightly hedge our bets. He, uh, we got Tom Bulo, who's a wonderful writer, who wrote a book called Adlands, which I'd hugely recommend, um, which is a novel about the Welsh border and generations growing up um, near the Wye Valley around Irwood. Uh, it's fabulous. And Tom really knows that land uh, in that local way. You know, I'm from the bits of the Black Mountains and he's kind of from the next bit uh, as writers. Uh, and he got an artist and he got Chris Meredith, the wonderful poet who lives in Bracken. And when I first discovered Chris Meredith, he would only get reviewed in like Time Out and the New York Times and the rest of the poetry doesn't seem to have missed him. He's an extraordinary, wonderful Welsh poet. And so they gave interviews in a conventional way, which were cut and dropped in. But what we did probably most radically in that first program, the sound walk along the border to Hay, so it's a 10 mile walk, but because of the terrain it took all day, um, was we did have a lot of space. I mean, there was a lot. And they would, they, Philip would say, don't talk now, it's fine, go for a bit. Just let us, so it becomes loads of ambient sound. And of course, on proper, proper equipment with real speakers in the way that they will edit, and that some of you will no doubt listen, it does sound extraordinary and that you do get this proper surround sound and the great richness and unexpectedness of sound. Um, I, I've, I was a radio producer, so I have some understanding of how it works, but only some. And one of the reasons I left radio producing was because I realized that that wasn't really my art form. But I do know uh, men and women whose it is, uh, and I'm sure there's, there's you here among them, um, but what's fascinating is when you work with them, 
So Julian May, for example, who's yet to do one of these, but as a wonderful radio producer, if you're recording with him outside uh, on Westminster Bridge or on a lake in Wales, and you're presenting, he will say, right, H, ready? I'll give you a signal. And then he'll wait for something almost in the rhythm of the day, in the rhythm of the natural sound. That's your moment. And it's fascinating watching him because he's listening with his ears, but he's also listening with something else, um, a sense almost of unheard rhythm. Uh, and their programs are beautiful, and they understand how you tweak recorded sound just slightly to make it as rich and enveloping, uh, if not more so than, you know, the sound of life. Um, so we did it, and I sort of narrated away, and I trust that a rhythm, that a walk has a rhythm. Uh, so, you know, you start off in optimism, it was a beautiful bright day, and then you find interest, and then at some point you run into, um, it's a bit like feeling deterred, it's a bit like feeling daunted. Uh, and almost every walk does this, and you wonder why you're there, and it's not really working, you want to go home. And that happened too. We found this strange, stony part uh, where there was nothing. It was just sort of nothingness up on the border, and it all felt a bit odd. Uh, and then you push through that, and then in theory the rewards come. Um, and so that was the first one. And uh, B um, referred to my father, uh, who was in his time a great radio journalist, Sony award-winning uh, correspondent, race relations correspondent in the days had those who covered Brixton and other riots, among many other things. And Dad was an exacting listener to radio. And he felt, and I think a section of the audience felt, although he was probably more Radio 4 than Radio 3, that there were a lot of footsteps. And that the stories I told were uh, slightly at a remove, in a way, from where he knew my strength was, which would have been one valley over, because then I could have told you everything. You know, I could have told you who lived in that house and who had before and what the gossip was. But that wasn't really what they wanted. They didn't really want me to get in the way. And I, that's something that comes very naturally in writing. Uh, you don't get in the way. The better you write, the less they notice that you're writing. Um, but less naturally in radio, where you feel that you are the presenter and therefore the mediator. But uh, what I think I came to learn was that that's not the, the, the job. The job is to stay out of this as way as much as possible and just not, not overthink it. So you over-research it. Um, as I then had to do with the next one, but don't overthink it. So the next one um, was made uh, by Lindsay Kemp. Uh, and so both he and Philip Tagney, interestingly, are Radio 3 classical music producers. So they can balance an orchestra. They understand music in, in ways that I will never. Um, Philip uh, and Lindsay, but Lindsay particularly, was a great expert on Bach. And they really wanted to do Alan's idea again, a walk in Bach's footsteps. Uh, and sometimes you have an idea that's so good you know, you just put the basic work in and you really can't miss. And I felt that with my book, A Single Swallow, following swallows from South Africa, South Wales. Well, then in some ways the book proves the opposite is the point <laughs> that you can miss. Um, anyway, luckily, The Bark Walk was a much more successful radio, book, uh, radio program than The Swallow book. Um, and the way that worked was, so here's a man, me, who knows nothing about Bach. Here's a, a, a composer, a musician who is a worldwide treasure and wh whom anybody who knows anything about has a personal relationship with, and who a great many people know a hell of a lot about. Uh, and so why on earth me, and how on earth to do? And we had the technique down then. Um, it was going to be five programs leading up to Christmas, five half hours and 45 minutes on Christmas Eve. So big slots and everything. Um, and Lindsay was going to be much more busy. So rather than slow radio, it became sound walking. So you get a few footsteps, but really not that many. They're there, but that's not why you're there. You're there to see Germany, uh, to hear about Bach and to hear his music. And um, my job was sort of time travel, so I read up as much as I could about the period and about the history, you know, the wake of the Hundred Years' War. Um, and Germany then, when travel writing luckily was in its infancy, so there are some amazing accounts of people traveling across the, the country, uh, the sort of shattered remains of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, at the time that Bach was crossing it. And Lindsay just downloaded into me uh, as much as he could about Bach, particularly at that age, age 20 and 1705. And when I've thought about doing sound walks privately, so they seem to me to be a huge open goal for podcasting. And po obviously, as this festival recognizes, podcasting's next destination in some way is not going to be somebody, however brilliant, talking to a laptop. It's going to be somebody outside. 
uh, or in another environment, and God knows we need it now. Um, the real difficulty with it is that uh, for it to be really good, um, as Bach was really good, and that wasn't my idea, uh, you need at least three expertise. I mean, you've got the sound, you've got to be really good. And so Richard Andrews came again, uh, and he knew what he was doing. And of course, the pressure on a recordist is particularly poignant, um, not so much in Germany, where we could have got spares if things had gone wrong, but in Greenland, uh, you know, if something goes wrong and you lose the thing, that's it. The, the whole thing is lost. So you've got to be really good at sound, uh, both voice, uh, ambient, uh, and and the uh, and anything you might put in, like effect. Um, and then you've got to really know the subject. There's got to be something you can take home. And Lindsay knew that. Uh, and then you just need somebody um, to do the thing and feel on behalf of the audience what another you know, beautiful, ubiquitous, mostly unseen middle European evening feels like, as it might have felt like to Bach coming into Wolfenbüttel, you know, at the age of end of his second or third day. Uh, and those three things together, and then cut and mixed, obviously, by a, a pro, um, made a wonderful series of programmes. And uh, it really got to people. Um, I had extraordinary reaction to it. We had an extraordinary reaction to it. Um, and I felt I was getting it then. And because Lindsay, we'd recorded a lot, uh, and so obviously it gives him, the nice thing from a technical side is that you have seven tracks. So from a producer's point of view, if you've got unlimited time, it's a dream because they don't slur over each other. So, you know, you can fix anything. It's not like that producer's nightmare where you really need something and it's, it's slurred over with some other kind of noise and there's no way of disentangling the two or not beautifully. Um, they, that, that isn't the problem. The problem, obviously, is time, edit time. Uh, and so all the producers tend to walk with a notebook and they write down when they hear something that they definitely want or goes on the probables list um, in order to give them a, a fighting chance. But we're talking days and days and days in the studio. I think they booked two, three weeks of studio time for the listening, the cutting. I'm not just in studio, but, you know, the editing. Um, and then uh, a week in the studio mixing, etc. Um, so it's very expensive radio from that point of view, although presumably not as expensive as a London Philharmonic. Um, and we did it and it worked. Uh, so then greatly encouraged, um, they thought, right, we'll do um, Winter Wandering. And so we sent to the Black Forest again with Philip Tagney uh, and Richard Andrews again. And Richard carrying an enormous weight and not a natural athlete used to, luckily we both smoked, so we'd stop and smoke uh, and uh, so ourselves um, with Jägermeister and things, you know, just to keep things going, um, particularly on Bach, where he had to haul his load up and down um, the, the, the mountains, the Hartz Mountains, etc. And there were long days. Uh, you get fitter over the course of it, which is great, and so you feel more sparky. Um, but very exacting for them and very easy for me. Uh, Winter Wanderer uh, could have been everything that, that can go wrong. Um, so we went to the Black Forest, we, we traced uh, a, a route, uh, and it came very clear that what lots of the residents of the German Black Forest like to do uh, on a beautiful day in the autumn is to get out there with their Porsches and their BMW, particularly motorbikes, and have a Raz. Uh, and so it was very difficult to find any part of the Black Forest, or at least the bit that we were in. And by the time you're there, you've got no choice. You know, their TR time is limited. It's got to happen. But they didn't have howling engine noise over it. In fact, if you listen very carefully to that program, you'll hear that a lot of it has... Um, from soundscape. Although there was a journey, there was also a lot of journey around one or two single pine trees uh, where we got the audio we needed, and I think it's probably repeated and doubled up. Um, but Philip made a beautiful program, and this one was much more about um, walking. So in the pure sense of this, I suppose, I remember talking and reading up a lot about Rebecca Solnit. I realised quite quickly uh, that we were going to be light on content. Um, and so crammed loads um, and wrote it down and took a notebook and pretended I wasn't reading out from the notebook. But then you can say so-and-so says, and it's clear to the listener that you're quoting, um, perhaps not from memory, but they don't really mind because you're still on a journey. And we did get a lovely arc. Um, and as all of you will know, as storytellers and readers and listeners, you know, the, the arc is sort of central to it all. But for that to happen, you need that rising sense of optimism you need a vent uh, and you need the come down. Uh, and when I teach it in kind of narrative theory, you know, it's you don't end with the Death Star blowing up. You end in the throne room and everybody recovers their breath and then they go out into the world. So narrative theory goes and are able, you know, to think on these things. 
Um, and the arc of Winter Wanderer was beautifully done. There was lots of Leder, lots of Schubert. We talked about Hermann Hesse and Nazis and Goldman, um, Solnit, obviously, uh, different uh, writers and thinkers on walking. Um, and then the big one, which was Greenland. Um, and again, Alan Davy uh, wanted us to do something, and it's, some, it's not exactly a blank check, but it's open to offers. And so we sent in, it was going to be Arctic, it was going to involve silence, it was going to involve possibly twilight. There was an Arctic season going on, so it's going to be cold. Uh, I, I, I didn't suggest Svalbard, uh, Spitsbergen, where I'd read in for the Financial Times, uh, because there's a lot of skidoos, actually, and you can find incredible silence. But a lot of time you spend on the back of a snowmobile and it's miserable in minus 40, hateful machines, although they take you to the outer rim, as it were. Um, and they, we thought Norway kind of too expected, so plumped for Greenland, and by a miracle they gave it. Um, and that was the Arctic Circle Trail, um, which is the most wonderful, extraordinary privilege, the most beautiful walking route. And it was proper um, in that, you know, within a few days of leaving, a polar bear was spotted on the trail, and therefore BBC health and safety kicks in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, we undeterred Jeremy Hyder. So this was Jeremy Evans, the first one, hired a guide with a gun, uh, who spoke no English and uh, us no Inua. And so off we more or less went. Um, and Greenland was wonderful because I, although I'd spent, so the way that this was worked was Michael Rossi, a researcher at BBC, sent me uh, a card box of books, which was the London Library's cream of their Greenland section. Uh, and for two weeks, I just read it uh, and wrote down everything that looked interesting in a moleskin. Um, and then we basically set off. Uh, and again, um, this time it was Andy Fell, a new sound recordist using the same kit that Richard had developed. Richard had moved on. I think he'd gone off to be a pop star, actually. And um, Andy, luckily, was very fit because we were carrying a lot of weight. Um, all of us, um, food, um, water, luckily, we didn't have to carry, although we did have it. Uh, but there was a lot of it about uh, batteries, um, worries about batteries not working in very low temperatures, uh, worries about machines failing. Um, not real worries about polar bears, wonderful briefing about what to do with musk ox. They were the real problem. The main thing is you must not look like another musk ox, because uh, that's what they want to do is mistake you for one and then take you out. Um, uh, and off we set. And by this time, I basically had it, which was don't force it. Don't cover the landscape with your voice and thoughts and anxieties. L live with all that. Take that along. Uh, just speak when you really don't have a choice. Um, different registers, so very tone. You know, sometimes it's detail, sometimes it's lichen, and sometimes it's a sea of mountains. And we, it wasn't, you know, you, at that stage you don't get lucky. I don't think in any of these we got particularly lucky, although the timing was bang on uh, in terms of season, not too hot, no midges, not too cold, no snow. Um, what we got was what there is. So Andy was able to capture the flap of a raven's wings, you know. And I was worried setting out that there wouldn't be anything because I'd seen the tundra and I thought we're just going to be crossing tundra for days and days. This is going to be a terribly boring program. So I read up like mad and had lots of green on facts. But a lot of time we didn't need it um, because of the beauty, uh, the strangeness, uh, the richness of the natural environment, the lights, the shades of weather, uh, the feeling of time being different, um, the feeling of Greenland being poised between a very extraordinary past and a possibly uh, world-changing future. In fact, it lost more ice that year. I think it's a world record, the uh, ice loss. Um, and again, Jeremy Evans, who's a very ebullient, um, very can-do producer, the kind of man, you know, 200 years ago, if in charge of a squadron of soldiers, would definitely have taken a bet for you. Um, wonderfully optimistic. Uh, and as they all are, as all you producers know, you know, you're anxious, you're anxious, you're anxious to the point where you've got it. And then you half dare to half relax. At that point, they become very happy. Um, and so physically, it wasn't particularly difficult, uh, although it was acting, um, but not, you know, not never in any danger of uh, it not coming off. Huts to sleep in, food to carry, um, and a lot of it was about silence. And of course, the press love that. You know, the idea that Radio Three are going to broadcast and they broadcast silence for Christmas, um, but in a good way. Uh, they weren't discouraging. They wanted to know. So that's what we did. Uh, we took them across Greenland. Um, 
and it was a life-changing experience for me um partly because on the first day jeremy had organized for us to listen and meet uh, some um, drum dancers which is a shamanic tradition in greenland and that was extraordinary um and though you know there's you you can't really be glib about that kind of thing um they were in touch with the spirit world that i have only ever glimpsed and yet they are actually in touch with it uh, and it was tangible and obvious and you can hear it in the program because he plays a little bit and um the wilderness there is not necessarily benevolent and spirits of the wild are not benevolent necessarily at all it can be hostile dangerous tricksters strange figures who are supposed to live out there uh, in the wilderness uh, people who have disappeared they told me about uh, gleefully um and all of that meant that you weren't just trudging across tundra you were trudging across uh the only world that was the actual world that is the world that hasn't been built over uh, marketed uh, and despoiled but planet earth um as i didn't quite dare say i suppose um but that's what it feels like now um and i think um you know being very comfortable with uh, my friends who became fast friends it's very easy uh, to open your heart to the place uh, and and let it speak um without feeling embarrassed or that you're forcing it too much uh, i'm still not the broadcaster i want to be but i'm getting closer so that that was awesome um and when we came back there was a kind of tide of euphoria because the programs went down very well um and I, again i don't think you know these people jeremy evans and andy fellow are incredibly skilled but it's not that it's not just that it's the art form itself which is clearly in its infancy is so rich and like all great art forms so simple um to access you know to start getting good at you know anyone can a recorder anyone can pick up a pencil uh, and pretty well anyone can press you know record on on a on a handheld recorder um that's partly what gives you and so as any artist knows if you put yourself in the way of it and any writer uh, and i know there are some here this evening um you put yourself in the way of it the job becomes much easier the task of creating the farm becomes much easier uh, and so greenland uh, really worked um and in the rush of euphoria afterwards they said well where do you want to go next so i so i was like well out of mongolia literally i'd love to go there the skeleton coast of namibia i've been there it's another world you know let's take them to another world uh, and all these things were in play except jeremy evans is mad on sailing so he wanted to do the west coast of scotland i thought that would be wonderful um and then covid um and so we had more or less settled on the faroe islands after some dispute uh we thought it's north again it will be interesting um they sent me the straight the normal box of books uh, and i started to take notes and at the time uh, so only a few weeks ago covid was uh, very limited in on the faroe islands but it has grown and so now all bbc foreign travel is a uh, subject to scrutiny at the highest level and you really have to be lucky to get away with it and it doesn't look like faroes will come off but they still want to sound walk so we're looking at bardsey uh, it was my suggestion um because i they we thought oh, islands maybe islands so bardsey uh, the farn islands and fair isle would make fascinating way of sidelong looking at our nation from its edges um and in bardsey's terms from its most you know whether it's the, it's the greenland of of britain for sure it's where the vales of thinnest uh, the thin peninsula the island of 20000 saints they call it um and it's a sacred place to me although i've never been there i've only ever stood on the end of the peninsula and looked longingly at it um so that's more or less where we are um and i i i think probably you've uh, heard enough from for me for now um so i will end and and say thank you very much uh, and if there are any thoughts or questions i'd love uh, for us to get involved in them um and perhaps andrew suggests that we might start with some kind of provocation um so uh, i'm going to say how about it doesn't sound very much so compared to some of them but uh, you could say something like uh, sound walking uh, is the ideal art form or the first art form of the post covid world great well thank you horatio that was really excellent uh, fabulous uh description of, uh, of 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 some wild and brilliant adventures and um i'm sure everyone here has uh, got some questions to ask of you but what we like to try and do is try to get a bit of a discussion going so if anyone would like to 
uh, perhaps uh, comment on, on on what Horatio has talked about and uh, and, and respond uh, about the post-COVID world. Um, uh, it's quite tricky because I can only see nine of you, and yet I know there are more of you in the room. So uh, we might need to get some people putting something in the chat so that we just uh, don't miss anyone who wants to say anything or uh, or, or write anything. Uh, but um, there, there were lots of things that I wrote down, but uh, I'd love to hear it from yourselves. So uh, has anyone got anything they'd like to say straight off and uh, just unmute yourself and, and have a go? It's David here. Hello, David. Yeah, Hello, David. Yeah, yeah um, uh, a bit of an amateur here. Just do you, when you do your sound walks, do you do you feel as if you're tapping into something we've lost way back, or whether you're tapping into something which we haven't um, in the future? Basically, what I'm saying is, um, are you experiencing something that um, one of our species would have experienced 200, 300, 400 years ago, or whether you're in the vanguard of experiencing something new, if, you, if that makes sense. It makes huge sense. What an interesting question. Uh, I don't um, feel particularly, except, you know, in moments in the, in the way that we all get it, uh, that this is extraordinary and novel to me. Uh, I don't feel it in um, the in connected to it in that way, but I do think that the programmes have the power to do that, and I think that comes uh, from the edit. I, I think it's to do with how they select uh, and my producers and what they use. Um, and so what you're trying to do is feeling of uh, kind of life itself, um, but obviously it's slightly um, artificially, um, I suppose, captured and reconstructed in the edit. Um, so I do think, though, that the, the, the effect of listening to them uh, is something that we've lost, which is probably you see it in rambling groups and you see it in families. But there was a time, even a few decades ago, where people walked much more than they do now uh, and walked for purpose. So you wouldn't drive to the shops or to school, you'd walk. And on the way, you'd fall into conversation and companionable silence with people you knew and didn't know and partially knew. And I see it and experience it around Hebden Bridge just because lots of people walk into town, uh, especially during the lockdown. And um, it struck me that that's kind of what I'm doing with the audience uh, and what you would be doing should you make a sound walk with your audience is that you're walking with people who you assume to be like you uh, in some ways or like you for the purposes of this walk. It could be anybody um, tuning into Radio 3 uh, and likely to be radically different in so many ways. And so to walk companionably with them and to say things, you know, that uh, aren't true or, un, un, you know, aren't not true, aren't unkind, aren't irritating, but at the same time have some value, you know, that doesn't uh, attempt to compete with um, with the walk, but in some way accompany it, is probably something we were all very good at, you know, 100 years ago. That was probably perfectly normal. Um, so in that sense, I think your question is bang on. I think that probably is an experience of, of listening to sound walking. Um, and the future, who knows? <laughs> I just think if you're walking in a group, you that you have a sort of natural filter not to offend. Whereas in, in the sort of normal course of life, it's so easy to offend people by Perhaps, perhaps the fact there's, there's you're trying to make sense of so much going on around you, but it's, it's very hard when you're walking in a group or walking with someone. There just seems to be a natural filter that you that you you both connect, and um, you know, offending people just disappears. You know, it's um, it's as if you're both you're both um, feeding into the same the same spirit. Um, Whereas if you bump into someone in the street in a normal hectic day, you're more than likely than not to either annoy them, offend them, or something. Anyway. I'm sure you do. I'm sure you, do. you know there is this thing they call it dopamine politics, where the idea is that you, uh, you you trump it about and annoy and enrage and fascinate, and that is how simply by pumping dopamine into your audience, who are now so adapted to staring at screens and looking at the largest, loudest moving thing. That's how you win. Uh, and I think in some ways, uh, certainly Slow Radio seems to me 
in, in political terms, to be a total rejection of that, in that it privileges that space for the listener's actual reactions, rather than in tempting to either enforce or hoodwink or distract. No, I, went, I remember Pastor Wentworth, Andrew actually ran a walk in um, Wiltshire and um, for about 400 metres, we all had to walk without saying anything. <laughs> and it was, it was, it was, it was, it, it was unusual, put it that way. <laughs> and um, it was just a simple thing, nobody saying anything. All you could hear was their footsteps. And um, your, your mind sort of said, oh, I, I can sort of remember this from somewhere. I'm not quite sure where it is. It's there somewhere, but it was, but it was new. And um, yeah, no, all power to your elbow. So um, um, I've enjoyed your, I've enjoyed your um, speech. <laughs> Thank you. I was just going to say, I, I do a lot of walking alone, and I love that because you don't have to bother to talk at all, and you can just listen to everything and stop whenever you want to. But I, just a practical question, I was thinking I'd really like to walk the Arctic Circle Trail or the part of it you did, and I just wondered what the terrain is like compared with, say, Scotland or the Lake District. Is it is it hard going? Uh, thank you. That's an excellent question. Uh, it's, it's perfectly doable, actually, Mavis. Um, compared to Scotland, where Robert McFarlane nearly killed me, only because I'm really unfit, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, there are bogs, um, there are ascents, uh, and weight is your issue, but you don't have to carry a tent because there are huts a day's walk apart, and it's not too punishing a day. Um, you would definitely do it. Um, yeah, Scotland makes a, a good comparison. Actually, it's more like Wales. Wales is slightly gentler on the legs, I find. Uh, it's not those punishing, huge, uh, obdurate monsters that the Scottish Highlands are. And you know how you have to kind of break yourself before you even get to the foot of them uh, through all those bogs and stuff. It's not, it wasn't that bad, but you'd really want to time it right. And we went in not, September, um, and that's when to go, because before then, it's very wet uh, and very mosquito-y. A lot of the comments in the books, people had been eaten alive. Um, and then after they close it, uh, it's worth looking and just going just before they close it in the winter. Oh, well, um, I, I bet tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, a, a year's preparation wouldn't yeah. be excessive. It would be delightful. And so much yeah. wonderful reading to do on Greenland as well. Mm. I've been on the West Coast, but I haven't mm. been inland. Mm. Oh, well, then you'll, you know what you're dealing with. Hi, hi Horatio. Hi, thank you for your talk. It's very interesting. Um, I've been listening to lots of podcasts during lockdown and found it really uh, transporting, you know, when you can't go outside yourself to listen to somebody who is outside and talking you through it. And I just, I think it's incredibly, there's something very intimate about just listening rather than looking. And I wondered whether you've got any theories about or whether you agree with that, first of all, and, and if so, um, if you've got any theories about why it might be. Hello, Jill. Good to see you. Um, congratulations on your amazing book. Um, so Jill's got a book coming out, and um, The Mahogany Pod, and it, it must be read. Um, I, I'm very visual, uh, visually directed, and so I naturally look. But I understand. Um, so one, um, Martin Eccles has put in the chat. Um, you know, why why have any spoken word at all? Um, and it's it's a, it's a fair question. Um, I think for us, I, I, because I used to produce radio and because I got better at it, and I love the, the medium, absolutely love it. Um, I'm aware that you 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 need to, the, the recorder needs to be running, and you need to be uh, ready to hear. You know, when when the geese fly over. No one needs to be speaking then, um, and perhaps you know you flag them up. Oh, here comes a skein of geese, and then you shut up and, and let it be. Um, but then, of course, you know, they also say radio has the best pictures, and so it is the privilege of being a speaking voice in someone's ear, not to be taken lightly, um, uh, but also not to be underused. Um, and so I, uh, I guess it's it's a it's a fine balance, isn't it, where in the doing of the thing. You leave space for both, and then in the editing of the thing, you think about how you want to balance it. So, if Martin had edited Greenland, 
we would have had a lot more of that great space and silence. Um, but it, it, the way that Jeremy did it was essentially like, an, like a children's picture book. So you just got a few words along the bottom and then hopefully those words are enough to help the sound be the enormous kind of picture that it is. Thank you. I love I love that idea that it's like a child's picture book with with just a, a caption and then the listener does the work, I suppose. And that's what's so that's what's so transporting and so liberating about it. So thank you. Not at all. Jeremy. Oh, hi, Horatio. Um, I'm really fascinated by the um, the the expedition, and once you've finished that, how did, and you know it's all been sent off or recorded or whatever. How do you, as the artist maker, cope with the gap between it happening and then the audience at some distance in the future? Uh, so it's very kindly phrased, but really I'm only one third of the leg. I mean, it's a compound art form in the way that we do it. It's definitely three people plus okay, an editor so with fresh yeah, ears yeah. who's got nothing invested in it. So Jessica Isaacs will listen to it and she doesn't care that we had the best time of our lives that afternoon and saw incredible sights. She's only hearing what the listener's going to hear. So she's a, the ears of the listener, really. So it's four people. Um, and uh, I get um, I get emails which say, hmm, might start with this, and it's going well, or uh, we're all knackered, but it's sounding good. They sort of keep me in the loop a bit, and then they send a rough cut, and uh, the rough cut's an amazing experience. Um, it has been each time, because uh, what the producers of that level, uh, and I'm sure many of you know what this means to do, is utterly not just transformative, but elevating. So something that was wonderful. I mean, walking across Greenland for a week was wonderful, but get that down to three hours and it sounds better. Um, and that's just uh, marvelous. Uh, and then you sit back really excited and wait for it to go out. Um, and then thanks to the internet, of course, you know, in the old days, you were lucky if your mum gave you a call when Front Row came off air and you'd finished producing it and sweated your guts out. Um, but now, of course, thanks to Twitter, Facebook, etc., you get it straight away. Um, and suddenly you are having conversations, really quite personal conversations often, with people all over the world um, who have felt that, you know, they walked across Greenland. That's the trick. That's, the, that's what you're aiming for. So, yeah, it's a compound form. So you as the maker, um, that would be very exhausting. You know, were you recording it? researching it, speaking it, and producing it, which no doubt is how it goes, um, I could see that would be a big one. And you'd really want a reaction, but you'd, you'd want a long rest between the two of them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Martin, do you want to make any comment on, um, on, 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 on what uh, um, Horatio's uh, answer to your chat question was, or chat remark? Um, well, the first thing to say is thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed the conversation. And there's a bit of me that's just thinking about the technical stuff. And uh, there's another bit of me thinking about the art. And the technical stuff's really interesting. And um, I really enjoyed hearing about that. The, the thing I'm interested in, I've been continuing to think after you responded to my chat comment was, what is the relationship between sound and spoken word? Certainly in an artistic installation context, um, I use variants on multi-channel presented, simultaneously presented sounds. Sometimes, very occasionally, spoken word, it's usually read poetry. And putting text into the space to allow somebody who's in the space to explore that. And I, I can understand that at one level, um, it, it 
it kind of goes with the territory. This is this is what radio has been pretty much forever. Um, but I'm interested in kind of the boundaries and where what what that relationship is, how it can be broken, built differently, pushed, stretched. I'd be really interested in your thoughts on that. Uh, that is, is fascinating. So the only thing I can compare it to is um, something like poetry. You know, there's a wonderful uh, Glyn Maxwell's book on poetry, uh, which really opened my eyes when he said a very simple thing, which of course it's not about the black squiggles on the page, it's about the white space around them. Uh, and that uh, really changed my thinking about how you uh, teach poetry, I suppose, which uh, is one of my ways of, of learning about a thing. Um, in terms of uh, the art form, I think radio fights very shy um, of art. I mean, they used to be um, like between the ears on Radio 3, which some of you will know. Which was an, it, it, it was set up to be an experimental radio slot. I'm sure they still do it. And Radio 4 now do it more too. Things like shortcuts, which is fascinating. Single voice speaking, but produced to make it like a mini documentary. So you get sound effects in the background, which may just be music or effects or bits of um, submerged sort of speech, um, much more kind of sonically ambitious. Um, when our programmes have been up for prizes, we've tended to lose out uh, to German radio, actually. Um, my colleagues who've attended the prize giving ceremonies and come second say, when they speak to the German winners, they say, we have shed loads more time to make the stuff. We have more budget and we have um, slightly more adventurous uh, listener appetite. And I don't think there's um, anything unadventurous about the appetite for British listeners. In fact, the success of Slow Radio proves the opposite. But, you know, a norm is a very powerful thing, isn't it? And if you listen to commercial radio, it's clearly trying to compete with the internet. It's the constant distraction, jangle, dopamine fix, the new, new thing, etc. It takes a brave broadcaster, normally late at night, to slow down. Uh, and you'll remember, apart from Between the Ears, wonderful world music programs on Radio 3, which also would have space and time. Uh, and lots, um, I, th I believe that uh, Radio 4 are doing, I haven't heard it yet, but they're doing a late night one, which is kind of designed to send you to sleep, but kind of not. Um, I think it might be Jarvis Cocker or, or somebody presenting that. Um, they did do a series of night programs, which he presented, which were really good. Um, and under all that absolutely is art. And the point is that the people making the stuff, you know, are, are obviously among the best in the world, and they do, but they're, they're very used to, when I joined Radio in 98, uh, they were still playing out on magnetic tape, still editing, you know, in the studios on magnetic tape. And there was a feeling that, you know, you, I used to ask, how long do you want this feature to be? And Julian would say, well, how long does it need? And you could have seven minutes, you know, between 7.15 and 7.45 to really explore something, particularly in August and in the silly season, so-called, where uh, you've got little bits of art made. Um, but obviously the, the tension, you, you're right, there's something there, isn't there? This desire to entrap, in a way, and to hold and to entertain versus uh, a desire to go somewhere with the listener. Uh, it's a challenge to, to, to dare yourself, I suppose, as producers and makers, say, see how they find this. And of course, with the rise of video art um, and then the proliferation, you know, of uh, home-based broadcasting, there's much more of that about now. Um, but uh, it's been a while, and I do look for it, since I've been to a gallery and found a really interesting sound installation. Um, I'm sure that world exists, but I'm afraid I'm not avant-garde enough or mobile enough to have accessed it. Um, and I guess in some ways, slow radio is a lovely compromise, isn't it? The slow is the art and, and, and radio is kind of the craft. Mavis, again, hello. I'm, I'm thinking again about this silence and background. Um, I, I haven't got telly and when I watch things online, I find myself almost always totally irritated by unnecessary music in the background. And I think the thing about music is that people have such different musical tastes that if it's, if it's the wrong kind of music, 
and you immediately switch off. Um, but with speech, um, you don't have the same problem. I mean, the problem is that you've got to have a good speaking voice um, if you're going to be broadcasting. Oh, that's my telephone. I'm going to noisy thing. Um, so that's that's one thing. I think radio doesn't use so much background music, which is a good thing. Um, I also wanted to ask you, was yours completely improvised, your script, or did you have anything prepared? Or did you immediately react to whatever you saw as you came over the ridge or whatever? I think um, silence is intensely political, isn't it? It's so, you know, the computers don't want us to switch off. No website wants us to leave. Everything uh, demands of us and monetizes that. Um, and, you know, political power follows with it. Uh, and we won't forget, of course, that it was radio instrumental, of course, to Hitler's rise. It was when they discovered that the two things could really go together. Um, and in some way, that uh, that lust has never been lost. And if anything, just diffused more widely. Uh, you know, you, you can see how Donald Trump descends directly from Rush Limbaugh and those shock jocks. Uh, it's all the same thing. Uh, in around all that uh, is the great silence, you know, the silent so-called silent majority, but the silence both of the voiceless uh, and the unlistened to, and the silence of truth, uh, none of which is given a, a great deal of, of, of play, I suppose. Um, I had an extraordinary experience last week in France. Uh, I live here near a, a river, uh, a beck, and so although we get very quiet nights, you always get the beck. And uh, in France, it was near the Verzaire in the Dordogne, so near Lascaux, in fact, the caves where we settled, uh, where Cro-Magnon man, you know, European man kind of came into being. Um, and art came into being, let's face it. Uh, there was one night where I went out at four in the morning, uh, and then the night was completely still, not a single cicada, nothing, not an owl, and there were lots of them, but nothing, and just the stars. And I suddenly realized that I, it wasn't a separation between me and the silence of space, but the silence of space of the stars was also on the ground and around the house, and I was standing in it. And it was absolutely an astonishing, astonishing moment. I thought, when do we ever get the silence of the planets? And of course, it's always there. And you'll have seen, you know, in lockdown, seismic noise activity dropped. There was this extraordinary moment. So we've all had much more of a glimpse of it, thanks to this incredible kind of uh, cursed blessing of, of, of the changing of the world. Um, so yeah, I, it is a it is an astonishing force to identify and to think more about. And I salute all of those of you who do. Um, but just to answer your question, there was one scripted bit which was at the end of Greenland as we came down uh, after this amazing walk, uh, which had really changed us all and had been such an intense and loving and loved experience. Uh, and Jeremy said, "H, you want to write something for the end?" Uh, and I said, "Sure." And I knocked it off because it was really easy then, and just walked down and I did the last link, uh, pretending not quite pretending I wasn't reading it, you know. Um, but otherwise, uh, no, it's, it's all um, it's all live, as it were. Um, I, I'm particularly interested if there are, um, uh, Gert, you're a, a musician, composer, um, because something that we often talk about when we talk about sound walks, we say um, it, you, we compose a sound walk. And, and I think there's uh, a couple of things you mentioned uh, when you uh, were talking, Horatio, about the unheard or the unheard rhythm, and and how we kind of embody the rhythm of not just the walk, but also um, you, you know, the, 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 the kind of composing the, the kind of atmosphere that we're experiencing through the radio. Um, I want to get. Do you want to make any comments on that, or anyone else who's a uh, 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 more of a musician than I am, and would like to make a comment on that. Well, I think um, you you have to be very careful when you talk about about, about silence and music. Uh, they are two very different things. Although silence may be uh, the ground of, of uh, uh, the breeding ground of, of, of music, um, it is. Um, um, it is a world apart, and 
I, I remember that um, um, when I um, uh, when I started to to, to work with sound uh, after after studying and, and working with music a lot, uh, I became part of an of a group in Spain which was called Escoitar. Escoitar is the Spanish word for to listen, uh, which was an inter was an inter interdisciplinary group of people all with their own interest in sound. And after a long discussion, we said uh, we cannot exclude uh, silence uh, from our from our interest, from our research, from our uh, creative uh, uh, the, uh, creative uh, approaches. Uh, to, and uh, uh, and we decided the, f the first thing to do was actually to go as a group. When we we founded a small group with our people. Uh, to go to the city park of Santiago de Compostela with our recording equipment. Uh, it was the first day of autumn uh, to, um, uh, to go to the biggest tree in the park and to record uh, there the first falling leaf uh, of, the, of the autumn and to wait for the, uh, the leaf to fall, uh, which was a sort of um, the, um, um, uh, statement uh, that uh, uh, two things were insep inseparable, inseparable from uh, the experience of sounds, that is the waiting for something to happen and as well uh, the silence of things. Uh, so like uh, what is the sound of a, of a leaf falling and to make the statement that these things, even they cannot be recorded, can be um, can be part of your recording um, 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 intent uh, of your recording um, the, the practice. Uh, so, um, on the other hand, what you what you t tell about rhythm, um, I think uh, in music there is uh, one thing that is um, that is defining for. Uh, for every uh, musical and, and, and composing or um, experience, and that is the, the culminating point. And uh, it is described often that as a musician, once you are you are feeling the culminating point, which is not depending on 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 the on the score, but, but but on the feeling of you as a musician going through a score, a musical score, um, as as a bog, uh, like in the landscape. So you you can go up to a hill. Um, uh, like in a musical piece, uh, is is a landscape, and then you feel that you're at the culminating point, and then you go back. Uh, this culminating point is a moment of of, of stillness, and uh, of um, um, so it is not. I don't see sound as a physical um, a physical experience, but I see it as an as a very human um, the lived experience um, in which um, uh, the, the element of silence is, is, is always present. I'm quite interested in, um, you mentioned Horatio that um, certain environments that you were uh, visiting uh, you had sort of anxiety maybe about the kind of things you might find polar bears or um, you might also um, have anxieties about what you're going to capture uh, and it's, you know the the nature of the program when to speak when not to speak there's a lot going on um, a lot to manage internally um, and I just wondered is there a practice of cultivating an interior silence that um, helps to manage uh, your uh, your own presence um, as a presenter, um, and if so, if, if perhaps you could, you know, is there this, this sort of practical things that you do, or um, uh, or just a, an approach that you take that might help to, um, you know, to help convey that sense of silence from yourself, um, as well as capturing the, you know, some of the wonderful silences around you. Thank you, Richard. Interesting question. The um, so the, my, my worry was, uh, having been to Svalbard, which I found one of the hardest places to write about uh, you know, in, a, in a journalistic travel writing sense, um, because there were very few animals uh, and there were no people. So my editor at the Financial Times uh, isn't a great fan of endless landscape description, 
Um, and in fact, you needn't have worried. You know, there, 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 were, there was, of course, there's enough, and particularly with history uh, and with a journey, uh, with what there is there, and in the space of 1,800 words is what you get. There's more than enough. But I did worry in terms of radio. Uh, you know, if if we really are just trudging across tundra, what's the content? You know, what what's the excitement for the listener? And uh, my worry about polar bears really was that we wouldn't get one. You know, I, I love action, and um, and and listeners enjoy it too. Um, and of course, you're not setting out to provoke action, but um, uh, it did strike me that before I started doing the reading, I was worried. And then when I started the reading, I realized it was amazing and that there was so much to say and that if necessary, I could I could do, um, I could present an, an amazing, you know, not my place to do it, but it's how I make my living, is going to uh, often astonishing at places uh, um, and telling what story I find there. I could do a history of um, you know, our in human engagement with Greenland uh, and, and the natural world and what was coming to Greenland and those sorts of things. So I had quite a busy head, I suppose, before we set out on the walk. Um, and then in terms of the cultivation of inner silence, uh, I struggle with that. Uh, in fact, my therapist, um, uh, late uh, a wonderful therapist, said, do you ever sit and do nothing? And I thought, you, you mean not looking at nature, you know, which for me often is, which I do a lot, um, but not even doing that. She said, no, just sit and do nothing. I said, no, I never do that. And you count smoking. She said, no, I don't count smoking. Yeah, I said, I never do that. Um, but actually, I get that stillness uh, from walking um, and the rhythm of the thing. And what we were talking about, the idea of, so we, we're, we're addressing, aren't we, the idea of intangible rhythms, um, which get sort of gestured towards that uh, where you've got a thing that exists, um, at least we sense its existence, which is both kind of the rhythm of the day and the internal rhythm of the walker. Um, and the idea that by shutting up, we might bring them into harmony. And by listening, and even if we're not listening to sound, obviously, but sort of being, um, we might uh, experience, um, I suppose, uh, richness and depth uh, in, in unexpected ways. Um, and I definitely get that from walking. And I definitely think that, um, you know, again, it's something that we are naturally separated from a lot of us. Um, so, as you'll know, if you switch on a tape recorder outside at 2.30 in the afternoon and do the same thing at 10.30 in the morning, it won't be the same, but there will be kind of family resemblances because the natural world kicks off, doesn't it, first thing early. By the time we're about, a lot of, you know, animals and birds are settling down because they've had their morning feed. They must think we're tremendously lazy, I thought, during the summer months. You know, they've been up for five hours by the time we share our heads. Um, and days change, you know, uh, and wind changes and surface temperature changes, and you can hear it, and we know it, but we know it instinctively rather than consciously, I think. Um, so I find that fascinating. So when you're doing, you know, a, a walk and you're recording all day, and then you cut it uh, into, say, four high points, you're coming in and out of different, very different background sounds, even if they're just variations on silence. Um, and background temperature, of course, and all the things that affect both the experience of it and the voice. Um, and I can hear in my own voice if I've been walking for a long time, not because of the kind of heavy breathing, but just you can feel the rhythm in it, I suppose, uh, and the progress uh, uh, and the, the looseness. Um, and the last programs, which I think take the listener uh, on a subconscious level with them, are you, what you feel at the beginning is a wound spring, you know, the excitement of making the thing, and what you get at the end, hopefully, is a kind of uh, post-climactic calm where the thing is done, you know, uh, and there is all to be assimilated now, uh, and often in silence. And in fact, my best piece of advice about travel came from a guy who rode around Spitsbergen, and he said, I did a lot of my preparation before I went in bed. I said, what do you mean? He said, I used to lie there in the darkness, in the silence. I used to just think what could go wrong, and I'd think what I would do about it. And that's a great way of kind of untying inner knots. Uh, so I'm a great fan of that. Um, that probably doesn't answer your question adequately. You, you, there was a really fascinating heart to your question, which is the cultivation of inner silence. So I thought I might, I might have just lost the end of that, but no, I think it did. I think what you were talking about with the 
uh, the rhythm of walking and the kind of immersion in the environment as well as being, you know, being quite stilling in that way and of course the sort of the, the elation at the end and the exhaustion perhaps as well um, of coming to the end of a walk so thank you yeah Mel do you want to chip in anything and then we I've got Babak having a question and then we'll come to Babis again but Mel yeah <laughs> well actually uh, Richard great question because I my question was very similar um I I teach meditation and I'm really interested in the internal silence and the external silence and how one has a relationship with the other and how one affects the other. And I think one of the things I was thinking about, Horatio, as you were talking, was um, about this idea of silence and as we slow down and we become probably closer to our true sense of who we are, our true self, through slowness and stillness and silence. I was just, I would like to hear your thoughts on your experience of um, being in a slow, um, a slower paced environment and recording it and how much you merged with nature and the environment and how that impacted on your experience of slowness. Uh, thank you, Mel, a fascinating question on a subject that you know much more about than I do, and I've clearly thought much more about. I mean, the, the thing about the sound walk is that you're, you know, you're, in some way you're hunting, aren't you? You're trying to bring back uh, the story, the program, a, a beautiful thing, trying to, uh, you know, did we get it, you know? We got, we got it. We really got it. That kind of vocabulary, which betrays that, you know, mission-based uh, kind of sense, which doesn't um, really kind of vote towards uh, inner silence. It was much more kind of companionable. It was shared endeavour, I think. Um, walking for long hours, though, and carrying weight um, is, you know, you do turn inwards. Of course, you do in a good way, which. That mixture of kind of tiredness and endorphins, um, which I think probably uh, yoga practitioners know about, um, which helps uh, to level uh, and balance um, and strips away kind of bullshit and nonsense. There's something very honest, isn't there, about that kind of um, tension of fatigue where you're not stopping, where you're keeping going. Um, I know all those things. Um, but my main experience of slowness and slow people actually was in container shipping. Uh, I went around the world on cargo ships for a book, uh, and that's a very different pace of life. And it took two weeks to cross the Pacific, and we time jumped every two days, three hours forward, so time became very loose. And then we crossed the date lines, so we had two identical dates. And the thing about the seafarers is they have a very different relationship with time. Um, they want it to hurry up, but they know it won't and that it can't. Um, they want to get to the next landfall. They always feel excited to leave port because it means you've done another and you're on your way to the next, you know, and excited to arrive in port because you might have some fun for a couple of hours if you're lucky. Um, but, you know, they measure their time in contracts, which can be six, 12, nine, you know, however many months, 13. Um, and at the same time, the oceans can be incredibly slow. Are, or incredibly violent and fast. And when things go wrong in shipping, it's slow, slow, quick, very quick. Uh, and so they have this demeanor about them, which is basically ready for anything but resting, you know, resting in competence, in, in, in competency. So in being very competent, they rest, they do their work, they take it easy. And then when stuff gets hard, they absolutely grit their teeth uh, and go for it at risk of everything. Um, and they reminded me of uh, a monk I met in Tibet who had the same, he was like a sea captain, he had that same no need to show off confidence, uh, a kind of quizzical uh, belief in the size and mystery of the world, but a very certain path of his own through it. Um, and it was exactly like a Danish sea captain who took me around the world. So I've seen and experienced slowness and silence in those ways, I suppose. Um, 
that sound walking, you know, it's it's work too, and you you can never quite. I guess you could, in your practices, perhaps you might talk about spiritual work and self-work, uh, uh, and I've sort of glimpsed those things. Um, Babak, you have a question. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's a very practical question, and it's born out of the following. One of the things that we're um, facilitating during Soundwalk September uh, is two collaborative projects, one of which is called 30 Days of Walking and um, where we invite participants or contributors to walk and record. And I don't think I realized it, maybe uh, Andrew had an inkling, um, but I think what we're really doing is asking people to make slow radio. Now, um, what these people, and myself included, are going to do uh, during uh, these for these recordings is we're, we're not going to have a backpack with a pole sticking out with five microphones on top of the pole and another microphone on a pole recording uh, walking and another one recording um, discussions uh, simply because it's not feasible we will have a cell phone now horatio thanks very much for the wonderful uh, uh, talk by the way would you have a, a very practical relatively low-tech cheap suggestion to use with for recording with cell phones Oh, that was such a kind thing to say. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid I, I don't have a smartphone. I have a, a dumb phone. I found that uh, I was spending too much time uh, on the loo going through you know, the Guardian or the Daily Mail. Um, so I got rid of it a couple of years ago. In fact, it fell into the loo one night and I looked down into the clouds. It looked like Blade Runner down there. I thought there's no rights on earth going to get that back. Uh, and I'm afraid I haven't had one since. So uh, I'm not the man to ask, but uh, my friends who do do this kind of thing say there are very cheap, you know, handheld recorders. You just need a little thing the size of a cell phone, looks like a shaver. Any, any uh, electrical shop will, 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 will coach you on them and with a rye coat and that, you know, little furry hat. And that will that will give you broadcast quality audio, actually, um, and doesn't have to cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. So uh, that's what I have. I have one of those um, would be my recommendation. Uh, and any cell phone that records, you know, you, you'll always double your money if you invest in a in a decent microphone uh, that you could stick in um, to the to the headphone jack, uh, and, and especially with yeah. the wind wind noise is a bugger. But that's exactly. And the other thing to watch is sorry. cable creak. Sorry, when you know the, the creak of the cable between the microphone and the recording device is the first thing they teach you when you join. So you, everything has to be anchored down. But that's that's as much as yeah. my as I can help really. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, but the, yeah, it, the question is a little bit more complex, specifically because modern cell phones don't have a headphone jack anymore. So you need a solution that works without a plug. Uh, so of course there are Bluetooth microphones, but they tend to be actually not very good, um, uh, even with a with a wind um, wind cover. Anyway, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, just uh, Babak, you also said there were two collaborative projects. So. I just want to chip in here that Babak has created a, a, a you know, a, a, a fabulous way in which you can record uh, uh, using just the computer that you're on. But do you want to just have a quick explanation of shorelines and what we're asking people to do? Sure. Uh, so the shorelines. So the first one is indeed 30 days of walking, uh, which is open during the whole of September. Um, anyone can sign up for any time slot during September to go for a walk and then to record uh, something during the walk, um, that is one. And the other is called shorelines, which specifically is about where water meets land. Uh, and we ask participants to contribute something that's written uh, and related to um, where water meets land. And then others or the same people to record the recitals of these writings. Uh, and indeed, you can uh, record these recitals directly on uh, the Walk, Listen, Create website, but you're also welcome to uh, record a video of yourself doing this uh, wherever you are and posting it to YouTube or Vimeo and then include it uh, in your submission uh, or record the uh, audio and post it to uh, SoundCloud. But indeed, you can also record directly to uh, the website. Now, at the moment, as it stands for uh, shorelines, I think we've got about a dozen and a half or so uh, people who've committed to participating for shorelines. We've got about the same close to 20 submitted writings, uh, but not so many recordings yet.
Okay, so uh, the next question was from Faye, and then we'll come to Mavis. Okay. Um, Horatio, thank you very much for this wonderful talk and your time. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to say that your um, Orison for a Curlew was a great companion book for me when I held a writer in residency um, to write some works around the um, re-establishment of the great crane birds on the Somerset level. So thank you for the wonderful Orison for a Curlew. What a wonderful thing to do. Uh, <laughs> it's great. Um, so I'm a landscape archaeologist and uh, an academic, so I specialise in phenomenology, the very nature of essence of experience and the sensorial engagements with um, places and landscapes. And uh, uh, I sort of cartographically map through the senses as an archaeologist. Um, and I've listened to your Arctic walk on a a uh, very long walk myself in deep, deep mist, and your um, bark walks on a long haul flight uh, from Tokyo back to London. <laughs> and those um, were real evocations, you know, that was, they are sound pieces, I'm plugging in my headphones. But what I'm experiencing is a, sen is a sensory experience of place. And I wonder, um, for you, my question for you uh, is, do you listen back to your recordings and do you get that sensory experience of place if you do? Um, I love the idea that you were listening on a long haul flight. I'm so good at it. Um, okay, so I do listen back. Um, my first instinct is to avoid my own voice. Um, but then when I worked with Ian McMillan, I realized, you know, there's a reason why he's such a superb broadcaster. And it's because he listens back to every program they make of him uh, and uh, critiques it. Um, and so I, I do. And I think, what, try and think what works and what doesn't. And it's a bit like reading your own work back, which I'm very used to doing. Uh, and you do it with less patience uh, than the average reader, you would hope because you're looking for false notes and indulgences uh, and in writing, you know, the wrong comma. Um, in um, sound walking, it's different. Uh, it was a very painful experience listening to the omnibus that they broadcast the last bank holiday. They rebroadcast Bark, all of it. Um, and the result was it was very repetitious for me. I kept going on about the bloody weather, you know, and the woods. And of course, in a program that's separated by 24 hours from the next program, that's not such a problem. But altogether, it was too much. And so, yes, I do. Uh, and it is wonderful um, in that they were such joyful experiences to do. Um, and so it's like I never take a camera on travel writing jobs because luckily, normally I have a photographer. And then you get to, you know, you get the best in the world documenting your holiday, basically. Um, I, I, I don't like being uh, photographed. I don't like, I'm very suspicious of cameras. If there was ever a time, you know, when the camera never lied, it now never tells the truth. Um, and uh, I'm gleeful about what writing can do that photography can't. Um, but sound is another dimension. Uh, sound appears to me, even with editing, uh, to have a level of veracity uh, and truth um, that even writing struggles uh, to match, perhaps. So, although Hemingway said, you know, that if a man writes clearly enough, anyone can tell that he fakes. Um, I, I do listen back, it, it, and it is a sensory experience, but it's also a very emotional uh, experience um, because of, you know, knowing what we were doing at the time and uh, thinking about my friends and, and kind of uh, missing it, but in, enjoying the facsimile of it. Sorry to keep coming back. I, I was thinking about um, the people um, you may have met, Horatio, when you were walking and local Greenlanders. Um, did you meet hunters and so on when you're out? And another question, were they very quiet people? Um, we didn't meet anybody on the Arctic Circle Trail. There was no one. Um, oh. When I was in Svalbard, we met two people. Um, and they, they, and they were, actually, we saw three, but we met two. And the second two were two who were walking across Svalbard together uh, in, with a dog, very extraordinary Norwegian women. And uh, in front of them was a single man walking by himself. And they'd been doing it for days. And they just simply decided, each group had decided not to meet the other in a companionable, silent, Nordic way. Um, so no, we didn't. 
uh, I did meet uh, people in the settlements, um, of course, and uh, they were fascinating. There was a barman who said something like, oh, you've been out. And we said, yeah, we've been out. And he said, so now you are full of joy. <laughs> uh, and we were. Um, and we met a wonderful teacher of Greenlandic. Um, she teaches Greenlandic children poetry. Um, she was amazing. Um, but no, I get the impression that they're, they're quite voluble, although there was something about silence among the Inuit where uh, it was acceptable and accepted that living in very cramped conditions, if somebody wanted to be quiet, you would uh, not acknowledge their presence and they would not be there. And the same went for couples who required intimacy. They would become simply invisible. Um, so different boundaries. And I found that too among the less well-off people uh, in Morocco, again, sharing very little space. Um, you were absolutely sacred about those bits of space and those bits of sound that didn't belong to you. They didn't exist. So for example, on the rooftops of Marrakesh, which was traditionally the women's place, uh, you couldn't see another rooftop even if it was right there staring you in the face, it was completely beyond the pale to acknowledge that that rooftop existed or that anything you saw there you had actually seen. Um, and this wonderful construction of spatial boundaries, um, perceptual boundaries that didn't exist but were imposed by culture for reasons of kind of personal sensitivity, I thought was absolutely marvelous. And you do absolutely find echoes of that uh, in places like Greenland, uh, anywhere where there's, where nature is big, you know, uh, and man is small uh, and money is short. I, I was just remembering because when I also went to Nunavut and met Inuits and they were saying that um, in their culture a uh, sense of humour is, is part of the culture and they were absolutely hilarious and laughed a lot and um, when, when they were throat digging with each other the one the one that laughed first was the one that lost the match but they, they were Full of humour, and it was absolutely hilarious. I was quite surprised, but again, that that helps to see you through dark winters, I suppose. Did you did you ever stand on top of a mountain and or anywhere and, and shout at the top of your voice and listen to the echoes? Because I find that something I love doing in an empty space. Oh, what an excellent idea! No, I never did. Uh, no. no, I haven't done that for a long time. Last time I did that, that, in fact, I was delivering pizza yes. on, on a moped during my university years. I was trying to do King Lear. I had to be uh, examined on it, and I thought I'd been oh, selling yeah. books while everybody else is buying them, and I roared out my frustration in my helmet. I did I did that coming down the, the Cornish coast once in a thunderstorm. Start, started spouting King Lear. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, lo I love shouting when I'm on my own and see what happens. You get a really good echo in my local playing field at six o'clock in the morning when there's no one else there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's my final word. Oh, shut up now. <laughs> okay, well, Silence well thank is you. golden. I, I think we're at that point where we've got to thank Horatio for a fantastic uh, uh, provocation and, and, and joining us for this cafe conversation. That's, that's to start with. Um, obviously, these these things are made by you. Actually, as the individuals who come along and, and engage with our guests. So, thank you also to yeah, you. Yeah. Nothing remains for me to say at all except thank you so much uh, for coming. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you particularly uh, to Geert and Andrew and Babak uh, for this wonderful month and for making this such a success. Thank you very much indeed. Good night.